Okay, we are in session 14 today and we'll continue with the uh, uh, statements in C sharp and in this session we'll look into the arrays initialization and declara declaration and arrays resizing using a readme preserve uh, specific to vb.net and collection classes we'll see some of the internals of the collection classes and we will be deep diving into these collections going forward um, and starting from today and also we'll see nested types and iteration statements such as uh, using uh, for each in iteration statements uh, such as while jump statements we'll see what are they and how can we use them and also system dot exception uh, namespace overview in the class overview uh, system dot exception and exception handling uh, statements such as try catch statements and we'll see a lot about the try catch today Saying that, let's continue with uh, session 14. So we'll see um, more about arrays today. So in the last, um, so far we have seen um, um, the arrays in C sharp uh, and how we declare them. So example here with the square brackets, open and close square brackets represent that you're declaring an array and we can initialize them. Uh, initialize the dimension um, by uh, using the new keyword and since um, uh, when you make this declaration it implicitly uh, refers to the system dot arrays class so your numbers uh, will ideally inherit from the system dot arrays so although int is a value type uh, your array of int becomes a object uh, which is a reference type so since it inherits from system dot array that's a key thing you to notify or remember and uh, the dimension or uh, the size of the uh, int is can be given at the initialization itself uh, or it can be given at the later stage also so there are multiple ways you can uh, initialize them and today uh, we're going to see uh, various ways of initializing uh, the uh, the arrays at the declaration time itself um, and uh, the new language features have given it more flexible ways to uh, declare them. Uh, we'll see uh, all of that. Uh, just to recap again, uh, so assignments uh, can be done using a, a for loop, iterate through the uh, the members within the array and assign the value to it by accessing through the indexer. Whenever you use um, the for, uh, you can access that using the indexer. Uh, like the numbers of uh, um, i, that means 1, 2, 3, 4, so on, whatever the index is and assign the value to it. And similarly, for reading out, uh, we can use a for loop to read out. Okay, so the, uh, the uh, similarly, okay, similarly the multidimensional array uh, we have seen uh, well, where you can have a two-dimensional or three-dimensional, so one uh, nth dimension to it and um, uh, uh, you need to iterate through a for loop, um, a nested for loop. In other words, this is uh, a nested for loop wherein you have a for within another for. So this becomes a nested for loop. And since you have two dimensions here, like a, a comma separated, the first dimension size is four and the second dimension is five. And we are iterating through the first dimension uh, uh, at the top level for loop and inner loop has a next dimension and we are accessing the values using the x and y so the values on the right hand side the output we demonstrated this code uh, uh, to show um, how we and initialize them or initialize the members with the values and then read the members out using a nested for loop okay and okay, so at the bottom part is again it's a three dimensional array where you have three dimensions to it so there's a four five three Okay, and uh, the last one we talked about is the jagged arrays, uh, wherein you can have arrays within arrays. Uh, in this case, we demonstrated having a byte, um, um, byte as a uh, jagged array, uh, wherein the first dimension has five, and the second dimension is open, and the second dimension is uh, initialized uh, while um, assignment uh, during the assignment operation. So in this case, we have uh, uh, five rows uh, of uh, five arrays uh, in this example. So, so the first five uh, rows we have, and all of them uh, got initialized with the, an array of another byte. And each of the array has a different uh, length. Okay, so that's what we demonstrated. This is an array of arrays. 
And this is what uh, today uh, we'll see uh, various ways to uh, initialize um, dimensions uh, or arrays. So we'll start with the first uh, first one, which is single uh, single dimensional. Okay, if we see the uh, way we initialize, we declare the uh, array using int open brackets close brackets and numbers one here, and initialize them. In this case, if you see the initialization, uh, we we are using a new keyword to create a new instance since this is a uh, system dot array um, and it's in class and it's an object so we need to use a new keyword to initialize it and in the first example we can actually uh, we are actually passing a length uh, as part of the initialization so int of 5 so that means it holds the uh, 5 values and we are initializing them with the values directly so in the in the previous example we have actually used the iteration statement for to iterate through each of the member and then uh, assign a value to it so instead of that, we can straight away uh, assign values during declaration. So this is the typical declaration and initialization statement. Um, so within this numbers one has a, a length of five uh, and has one, two, three, four, five as values to it. So in a single dimension. And similarly, the second example uh, shows a different uh, type, which is a, a array of string. And in this, it has a length of three, and it has three values to it. Okay, and the second set is another way to do the same thing. In this case, so uh, we are not passing this size. You see, the size is omitted here, and the size is omitted in the both the places. So that's again can be omitted, and you can just straight away give the number of values. So what the uh, compiler are going to do is it's going to determine the size of the array based on the number of uh, values that you're passing in. Okay, so going, uh, once you do this way, so its uh, size is actually fixed to the number of values that you're passed to, uh, which is five in this case. And down the line in the code, if you try to read int of six, uh, then it's going to break with the index out of bound exception. Okay, so you cannot, um, so there is a way to resize the arrays, uh, which is available only with VB.NET, not with the C Sharp again. So we'll see that also. That's a very interesting uh, um, and very useful um, uh, option available in VB.NET, wherein you can resize the arrays once they are declared. So in C Sharp, it is not a straightforward thing. Still, you can do it, but it's uh, just kind of a workaround. It all a matter of um, clearing this uh, array and then redeclaring that array uh, is pretty much like re redefining the same array again. Okay, so similarly in the second instance, we have a string of arrays and uh, the values here are assigned directly without this size. So this is again doable. And the third option, which is a very, very, again, uh, short, short form of the array declaration, which is available from uh, and 3.0 onwards. Um, this is simply just uh, declaring an array and then initializing directly with the values. So if you see, there is no new statement also. So you can omit the new statement, also the data type, and also the size of the array. You can just directly give a, uh, declare it and assign the direct values to it. So this is again a new form of uh, declaring arrays. Uh, so this this feature is available available uh, from uh, believe three dot dot and framework, um, and um, so the data type um, here is uh, is of course given int here and the number of values that you assign to it. Um, so it's taken and its dimension and initialization is uh, is uh, taken care by the uh, the compiler at runtime, and similarly with the multi-dimensional arrays. So uh, in this case, um, um, you have the dimensions declared in the in the in the first first place. So you can actually uh, give the dimension here, and here we omitted the uh, the dimension length, and here we completely omitted the new operator also. So this is again completely doable, um, and in the in this uh, uh, the later case, 
uh, we can give the values as a for multidimensional with the same syntax with the curly bracelets within the and uh, each this is initializing the first uh, dimension and this this one is initializing the second dimension so that's how it is um, you can do uh, declare and initialize in a single statement uh, in these many ways and the last one is a jagged array so jagged arrays are also similar we can do the same thing here uh, we can completely omit the new in the last uh, instance but uh, we are actually passing we are creating in, uh, initializing a new array and passing it as a uh, for the first dimension and uh, this is the first array and then this is the second array in which case we still use new okay so what uh, important point here is we can omit the new uh, this whole statement we can omit um, so that's our uh, new features added up in the um, C sharp okay so this is about the uh, initializing an array so although there is a demo here uh, um, you can actually try this out um, um, uh, don't have a code right now to demonstrate for you but you can actually uh, do a homework on this and um, try it out by yourself okay to keep it simple because we have a lot of topics to cover today and uh, yes here comes the reading preserve so this is a very cool feature of uh, visual basic dot net uh, this feature is actually a legacy feature which is carry forwarded from vb6.0 and uh, this is still supported in .NET also. Uh, uh, it's for the sake of okay, backward compatibility or whatever but it is still a very good feature. Um, still here if you see the, the code snippet here. So in this case uh, what we did is uh, declared a numbers uh, of type integer. This is only vb.net, okay? C sharp doesn't support read and preserve. So this is a vb.net code. Uh, that's why we use the dim numbers as integer and the, in vb.net, uh, um, last time we didn't talk about the vb.net code. Uh, this is a good chance to see how can we do arrays in vb.net also. Okay, so uh, within uh, in C sharp we use the square brackets in vb.net. Um, it's uh, open and close uh, um, brackets, and uh, using the new keyword we initialize it. With it. This is the size of it, uh, and of course it, it starts because it's a zero based. Uh, it's zero one two, so it takes three values to it. So this is how we can directly initialize it. So in the first instance, if you see, carefully see, so this is. Um, the size is fixed, which is two. So in the later part of the code, what if I want to have more than uh, two? So in this case, um, you can actually use the readim keyword. So if you see the readim keyword, so the uh, the numbers uh, is the same uh, identifier here, and the same identifier. Uh, in, in the first place we actually initialize with 2 and now I'm, I'm re resizing it uh, without declaring it again. So it's a, like if you see the dim statement and a read dim statement, okay, again read dim statement can be applicable only for the arrays not for any other data types. And so read dim uh, numbers with the same variable name and uh, the size I'm giving as 4, okay. Uh, so using this we can actually resize or increase the length or even you can decrease the length uh, based on the uh, need in the execution of the code and at this point uh, we're trying to print the values so uh, what will be the values at this point okay so if you see it's all gone to zeros so we'll 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 uh, show the code also. I just wanted to uh, explain the code before we run the demo. Okay, so if you see uh, in this uh, second case, when when we do the read dim, what happened was uh, all the values got gone. So if you in the first place, I have uh, one, uh, 10, 20, 30. So once I did read dim and print the values, it's all zeros. So all values are gone. So if you want to retain the old values, then what we need to do is we need to use the preserve keyword. So in this case, uh, read in preserve the same uh, key. What will happen? It is going to uh, preserve the old values. 
So the old values were actually uh, after this, uh, this statement, since we lost all the values, we actually initialized it using this for, wherein I initialized the new values here, new set of values here. So which is, uh, it's pretty much uh, uh, indexed or multiplied by 10, so since the first value is 0, we have 0 there and so on. So you have a 10, 20, 30, 40. So these values, uh, once I initialized it, I did the read and preserve. At this stage, I still have the values intact there. Uh, and uh, see here, I actually re, uh, read and preserve the same dimension with same length, therefore. I can even put 20 there. I'll have the first five values and the remaining will be zeros. Okay, so this is just a print statement uh, which is actually printing the array that is coming in. And key thing to notify, uh, just observe here, is the parameter that I'm passing in is of type system.array, since arrays are from system.array uh, class. Okay, so in the, for printing, I'm actually passing uh, print array. Uh, this is the method uh, that I've been calling here and passing the numbers, which is numbers here. So which is, uh, again, an array. So hope this is clear. So we will uh, run the core sample here. And uh, since this is a VB.NET project, okay, I will go and set as, I, uh, as you all know, so this code is going to be available soon after this session. Uh, you can download it from the link that I have provided earlier. So most of you already know. Okay, so this is a different thing. Uh, where am I? I'm with, yes. This is the code that I wanted to de demonstrate. And as you know, in VB.NET, to start the respective module, uh, in this case, array with read and preserve demo, I just have to go to my projects and uh, pick the, yeah, since <coughs> this is already set to array with read and preserve, then I can run the program directly. So this is what we see here, whatever we saw in the, uh, in the slides. And it's the same piece of code um, declared here. Okay, so in this case, um, so read and preserve is actually preserve the values that are assigned before, and this is uh, after read and preserve. Whereas read uh, can uh, resize your array. In this case, it was initialized to uh, two, which has three values there, and the, in the second case, it, it is uh, re, uh, redefined to increase the size to four, and it has five values. In this case, it doesn't didn't save or preserve the previous values. Uh, whereas uh, in the second, in second case, it did preserve the previous values. So what will happen if I um, increase the size in the read and preserve? Okay, so we will uh, change it to say 10. And also I don't want to have a zero in the first place. So what I'm going to do is, uh, so I will do plus one. Uh, and into zero. So if, let me check if it's a valid statement. Yes, this is a valid statement. So in this case, in the first uh, instance, when I, once I get zero, it is going to be um, added to one, so that I will not have zeros in the first place, okay? Okay, so that's the code here. So I see 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. I don't have any zeros in the first place. And in the second case, I uh, increase the size to 10 and I see first five values are preserved uh, since I use the preserved keyword and the rest of, rest of the five got the default values it's because this is an integer so for integers the default value is zero so clear and of course uh, a caution note uh, with the vb.net so if you Carefully see, this is again a highly debatable thing with the C Sharp versus VB dot and community. Um, since VB dot and has this luxury uh, to redefine the size at the runtime, and C Sharp doesn't have it, um, the argument goes like this. Um, so what happens uh, behind the scene is uh, pretty much uh, uh, VB dot net uh, is trying to give you the luxury. Uh, at the same time, at the cost of performance again. So if you um, 
if you try to use this uh, read in preserve statements so uh, very frequently uh, for example if you're doing it in a very iteration so if you have a iteration like a loop for thousand times and within thousand times you're reusing the read in preserve for several times or for each time then that's going to be a very very performance intensive operation uh, since what happens internally is that it's going to recreate the same uh, variable with the different dimensions. So what happened to the previous ones is will be in the garbage. Uh, so you will tend to create more and more garbages um, uh, when you do this. And also it's going to be uh, the operation wise it's going to be like creating a new um, variable and uh, giving you uh, the same name but now it, it has a lot of overhead behind the scenes and the uh, C-Sharp community claims that, um, that they don't support that because it's not a good practice. Um, so the arguments goes have back and forth again so you can still again ask the C-Sharp guys to see like uh, okay so if this is a laborious job so what will you really do if it, you really need it? To do so if you really need to have a, because in many cases you might not have a fixed length of arrays uh, in many cases right if you say for example if you take any uh, database records right you can you ever say that you can have only five employees in your database records no so it's variable in length right so uh, just to give an example so it's all case by case situation so if at all you really need it uh, vb.net supports that um, and you can make use of it but use it cautiously so that's a keynote okay so we're done with the read and preserve and now we are back to our iteration statements so so if you remember the entire journey started from uh, iteration statements and we have gone into arrays and also I think we went into the collections also um, to just to demonstrate the keyword for each so we have used uh, for to read, uh, in this case, yeah, in the previous case. If you see, we have used for to iterate through the arrays. And if you see the for statement, uh, it is a little lengthy, isn't it? Um, so we're actually making, uh, initializing it and then conditionally checking the value and then incrementing the value and then iterating through it. So using this, we are actually so we are writing too much of code there, right? So the easiest way to iterate through arrays is using for each. So just to um, cover this keyword, we had to uh, travel through the entire the concept of arrays. And uh, so the using for each, if you see, it's a very, very simple statement. For each uh, data type, and uh, uh, n of int and the it follows with in numbers so numbers is the array that we are using okay so it's pretty simple and there is no um, initialization there is no incrementing operation it's simply for uh, each within brackets uh, you're looking for uh, values of type int in array numbers that's how you read this statement so, uh, okay for each item of type int in numbers so that's how you read it. this statement it's pretty uh, much a straightforward English statement okay and we are reading the value out if you see uh, I'm just getting I out so I is the item in the arrays list Oh, array list is a separate thing again. This is only system dot array. Okay, well, let's be specific. Um, so array list is again a separate thing, uh, which we will be talking when we talk about the collections. Uh, uh, there are all types of collections available in um, the C# -sharp language and VB dot net language as well. So, which is going to be a forthcoming session. Okay, so this is about for each and using for each, you can of course uh, read the single dimension arrays and also the multi dimension array. And if you carefully observe, there is no nested for loop here. So in the earlier case, there is a nested for loop when we are talking about the uh, multi dimension array. And surprisingly, the, if you look at the output, output is going to be same. It will give you the same output all the values within the array all the values within the array but the code is very concise 
um, and for jagged areas that's an interesting thing so for that jagged areas you have to try it yourself so I'm going to leave some part of it to your bucket so that you can uh, get the source code so whatever code you see here is of course downloadable I'm going to publish them and you can get uh, take the copy and uh, when we meet next time let me know who all tried the jagged arrays to read using for each so I would like to um, if I don't forget <laughs> so if at all I remember then I will definitely ask you guys to tell me how can you read the jagged arrays using the same thing so we'll demonstrate this quickly now an iteration statements and uh, yeah and so I just grouped them into the respective statements so we have seen the selection statements we have seen the jump statements iteration statements we are looking at right now we we did cover the do for and for each we are looking and also while is there which is upcoming and uh, yes if I go back to this example so we did uh, run this code quite some time and this is the uh, difference between the for and for each okay so I will run this code and let me make sure um, we run all together so that we save some time I don't want to run separately so I'm going to run the uh, multi-dimension also and Okay, so this is a three-dimension array um, under multi-dimensional concept, and of course, jagged array. Uh, I didn't, I did not have the code here for using for each. I still have the only for. Okay, so that's the kind of a homework for you guys. When when we meet next time, uh, I will definitely ask um, uh, how can you read jagged arrays using for each. Okay. Okay, so we're good. Um, so I'm going to run this code pretty straightforward. And um, so we'll start from top. So this is the statement uh, using, a, let me walk through the code as well so that uh, we are clear. Yep. So this is the comparison here using for each. Uh, and this is a single dimension array and using for, oh sorry, using for and this is for each and using for each um, um, we see the same set of values uh, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16 and we, we use the same um, um, variable numbers to iterate and read out and one key difference so now so always remember the differences are very very uh, annoying people will definitely ask you these kind of differences okay although you can read an array using for and for each when will you use either of them and uh, what is the difference between them okay so that's a very important thing that you need to remember and uh, um, so the basic difference is that uh, for uh, statement has a more control on what you want to read uh, in this case using for you're actually making use of the indexer so if you see carefully numbers uh, within uh, brackets you have I so which is actually you're reading the uh, value for the given indexer so this will give you a very good hold on the which value you want to read out Okay, so whereas uh, for each also gives you a, a good hold, uh, but you you are not actually using the indexer. Uh, you are actually iterating in the order in which the values are stored. So when you say for each, it pretty much internally does the same uh, logic, wherein uh, it iterates to the end of the array, uh, looping through each and every uh, item in the array, matching the data type. So that's again a, a important thing here. So matching the data type is a key thing here uh, when we use a for each and for that difference uh, you will see when we use for each with the uh, uh, array list. So array list is going to be a kind of very interesting concept wherein you can actually put any data type within the array list. Since here um, the arrays are uh, data uh, type safe. 
So you can specify which data type of values you can store in an array and it can have only that type of data inside an array. If you try to put a, a string uh, into an int data type, uh, it's not going to work. Um, you can actually do some kind of an error uh, error on code and to verify that kind of uh, behavior. So in this case, uh, we'll try to do that exactly, okay? So in this case, what I'm trying to do is uh, uh, in place of uh, i into i, what I'm going to do is I'll just convert this to to string. So that I'm just trying to put the uh, um, number in terms of a word. So cannot implicitly convert. So if you see uh, the error that's coming up, it says cannot implicitly convert type string into int. Okay, so what it means that I have to give a integer data type to it, otherwise it won't take it. So this is a type safe. So arrays are type safe. Okay, so when we talk about error list, then uh, I will talk about um, more about the difference between array and array list. So one of the difference here we just observed is arrays are type safe. And again, uh, coming back to our discussion, um, for and for each. So when you talk about for, we have more control on which number we are reading. We read using the indexer. Whereas when we do for each, we are actually iterating through the entire list and uh, reading the value of the matching data type. So since it is array is type safe, it doesn't really matter here. For other data types, it really matters, okay? Uh, and also for each, you will not have a great control on which value you're reading. So as long as the data type matches in the array and then uh, reading the value out. So that's a key difference there. So when will you use uh, either of them, so that's the answer you go with. So if at all you have, want to have a greater control on what you want to read, then um, uh, for is a, a best option to go. And also another big difference uh, is that if you want to really manipulate the values within the uh, array, uh, then for is the best again. So using for each, you actually cannot manipulate the values because you, you're actually reading uh, the value directly. So the uh, so the, you're actually printing the value out. In order to update this value, you actually have to refer to the indexer within that array list, so which is not possible in array list. Which you can still, of course, um, do some kind of a, a logic, right? You can have, still have a con, uh, counter here, tracking the counter and then use that as an indexer and do it, which is going to be more lengthy code to write. So in that kind of cases, if you want to really manipulate the values within the array, then uh, you go with the for. So if you want to read only for the read-only purpose, so for is a good option, which is straightforward and simple. Okay, hope that explains. If you still have any questions on that, then just shoot a line. Um, I will take those questions at the end of the session. Okay, similarly, uh, we have uh, multidimensional. You see, um, this has a more granular level of control uh, using for and for each, although it is a bit lengthy code, you, you're you actually pinpointing to the which indexer, which value you're reading out. Although in this this example, it really makes no big difference because we are reading the all the values out irrespective of what. And it will give you the all the list of values in this case. This is a multi, this is a three dimensional array, which is a little lengthy. And uh, this is a, a two-dimensional array to keep it simple. So we have the same list of values out. So here we are actually specifying which indexer, uh, at which position, wh which value you're reading out. And of course, again, using for, you can uh, uh, manipulate the values, but using for each, you cannot manipulate the values. Uh, considering that you got that point. For each, uh, we used and uh, collections. We are going to go to the collections class now and this is uh, uh, again a very um, similar to arrays but it's a different um, story altogether. So you, you can use the for each to read the collections as well. 
to make a custom collection. So, so we were not uh, talking about the uh, system defined collections. So we will be talking about the system defined collections like the array list, uh, stack, queue, hash table, other things uh, we have uh, in the forthcoming sessions. Uh, when we talk about the collection class in general, uh, we're talking about the custom collections. So in order to ha use for each on top of uh, collections, um, you have to write your own collection, uh, a custom collection in other words. Okay, so in this case, uh, the two important things are getting introduced now is called enumeration. Okay, so enumeration is referred to uh, listing the elements of a collection. So how do we read uh, uh, through each and every item and listing them? Uh, that's called an, a part of an enumeration. So which is uh, similarly for what we're doing using for for each. So in order to use for each on a custom class to read the items the way we read in um, arrays, so we need to qualify the class uh, with the special attributes. Uh, those are your I enumerable and I enumerator. So there are two uh, interfaces here. So this is again a good uh, time to even uh, make use of a, a real interface concept. So we have seen the interface concepts in the object-oriented programming uh, where an interfaces are, do contain only the abstract members, they cannot have any concrete members within it, uh, which is similar to an abstract class where an abstract class can have a concrete members. Uh, that's the basic difference between an interface and an abstract class and we did see that. And uh, so interface is pretty much a contract. In other words, in simple line, if you want to define an uh, interface is a contract and uh, whoever inherits it must implement it. And that's what, uh, these are uh, I enumerable and I enumerator are the system defined um, interfaces which need to be inherited and implemented for you to use for each. And these two uh, interfaces are available in the namespace called system.collections. Okay, we are one step close to the system.collections now. Um, so uh, in this case, in this example, uh, what I'm going to have demonstrate to you, uh, this is pretty much implements the uh, string tokenizer. Uh, a string tokenizer is a, a normal behavior as a normal view. Um, it, this will take a string uh, string contains a number of words separated by a space. Um, so that's a sentence in, in ge general English terms. We're going to have pass a sentence to the uh, string tokenizer class and what it's going to do is it's going to split the entire string into words. Uh, we're going to have a collection of words. In other words, it's going to be pretty much a array of strings. So how are we going to do that? We'll see. And we'll, the string tokenizer is, uh, is a custom class which, which is going to have this, all these uh, behaviors uh, and uh, it exposes um, a couple of uh, required methods so that we, you can use for each on top of it. Okay, otherwise without for each you can still read the collection using for that's fine, but specifically if you want to make use of for each, you have to implement the i enumerator and i enumerable. Okay, we'll take a close look at the class here. So, so this is the class um, called the tokens. So this is the main class here, which is um, inheriting and implement inheriting i enumerable. That's number point one and one, and the i enumerable is a from system dot collection. So this interface is a system defined, and it has only one method, which is an abstract method. Of course, it is a, because it is an interface. An interface can contain only abstract members, which is a well known. No confusion there, and the abstract member is a get enumerator. Okay, and this class. Since it is inheriting the i enumerable, it must inherit, uh, implement this abstract member. Okay, so we saw that uh, examples when we talk about the interfaces. Uh, so this method is uh, implemented in class tokens. So what this contains, uh, we'll see. So what it's going to have is um, 
when we say as a name itself is self-explanatory, if you look at the get enumerator, what this method is going to do is it is asking to give you an enumerator. Enumerator again, if you see the basic definition, it's listing the members. Okay, so listing the uh, members within an array. So it's going to get an iterate uh, or enumerator which will iterate through the um, the collection within your custom class and provide the necessary methods. What are those methods? So this is nothing but the token extract uh, enumerator. So uh, this implementation which we will see uh, when we do the coding at a higher level glance, uh, the get enumerator once you implement what it's going to have uh, is the return of this class which is if you see this is a nested type. So nested types are the types that exist within a type. Okay, well, similarly to nested for, we saw when we're talking about the uh, multidimensional array. Similarly, you can have a nested types. That means uh, this is a class within another class. So this is the parent class tokens, and within this, I have another class um, token enumerator. Okay, and uh, again, the question if you have in your mind, does it always uh, needed? No, it's not at all needed. It's all based on a situations, right? <clears throat> this is a perfect example where I can make use of a nested type. And of course, at the same time, is it really, uh, uh, does this enumerator, the token enumerator must be a nested type? To, in order to make this functionality work, that means your get enumerator work, but it's not at all necessary. Uh, you can actually keep this outside this class and implement it outside and still uh, you can make use of it. Okay. So to just to introduce the topic of nested types and also making uh, this, I'm just trying to cover multiple topics at the same time. Okay, uh, yeah, so the get enumerator is going to create an instance of the token enumerator and written out, so which is the implementation of the get enumerator. And what does the uh, enumerator has? So this class is, since it is inheriting the enumerator, it has to implement these uh, abstract members. One is the property called uh, current, the other two are the methods called move next reset. So if, if you see these are the methods are pretty much used to iterate through the collection. So current gives you the current value, current uh, position value and move next is actually moving to the next item in the uh, the array. And the reset is going to take you back to the, the first object in the list. So pretty much these three methods are, uh, sorry, these two methods and one property is good enough for you to loop through the entire list, right, array. Um, so when you can, you can move next and then read the current value and again move next and read the current value, move next and read the current value. Finally, at the events you reach the end of it, uh, you can reset it so that you go, go to the top. So it's, this is what the base, uh, three members available in the I enumerator and these must be implemented in your token enumerator which is your class that is inheriting from I enumerator and this must be enumerated because your get enumerator um, returns a type called I enumerator. Okay, so enough of um, this explanation. We will uh, uh, go into the demo. Oh, okay, the demo is here. Uh, oh, sorry, let me walk through the code again before we get into the demo. Okay, so once we had an overview and this is the code that we have just um, had on a higher glance. Here, this is the parent class, which is called tokens and it is inheriting I enumerable. Okay, and, and what it is doing, it has a constructor, okay, if it, See, uh, it, it is taking two, uh, two parameters. Uh, it's a parameterized constructor, in other words. And remember, it is, again, keeping an arrays as a private member. So if you remember, this is an encapsulation implementation, straightforward, uh, wherein it storing the private member, um, the original data as a private member, and it is exposing this as a uh, private, public members. Uh, it is exposing through the public members, in other words. 
Okay, so that's the typical implementation of an encapsulation principle. So it has a private which is an array which is what we have seen so far and it has a constructor tokens and it is taking two parameters. Uh, one is a source which is uh, going to be used to get the sentence as a whole and you are also passing an array of char as a delimiter. So delimiter is just a name of this parameter and this is an array of char characters. Um, so if you if you're really uh, not sure what is a delimiter, delimiter is pretty much like this. Uh, it's going to be like if you have a, a collection of uh, values. For example, in the uh, previous session we have seen that we have initialized the uh, array passing one, two, three, four, five, so on. So in this example. Uh, the commas, if you see the uh, the comma separated values, in other words this whole string can be called as a comma separated values like a CSV and uh, the commas are the uh, delimiters. So using this comma I can actually uh, split all these uh, values into an array so that I have uh, each element in my array can hold one value at a time. So that's what even happens when you, when you initialize uh, your array passing this string like this, it's implicitly actually splitting the whole uh, string in using the comma separation value CSV or comma as a separator value uh, which is referred to as a delimiter. Okay, so using the same thing, um, this uh, comma is said to be called as a, a delimiter. Okay, for those who are not aware of what is a delimiter. So it takes an array of delimiters. So you can pass any number of delimiters. That means in a string I can have a space as a delimiter, also as a hyphen or any special characters as a delimiter. Okay. And next, um, inside this uh, implementation, since I have the source, the entire string, I'm using this special method called a split. So it's split is a simple straightforward method you can make use of it and uh, pass the delimiters as a whole you know you can have array of characters as a delimiters so in a string if I have a comma as a delimiter hyphen as a delimiter tab as a delimiter or space as a delimiter or so on so you can have any number of delimiters all that can be broken into an array with just this one single line okay so the word here, what, what the constructors have, are doing here is uh, breaking the whole string uh, using the delimiters passed in and uh, making an array. So this is, this array is, if you see carefully, this is your private member elements. Okay. Okay, let me clean this stuff here. So till this part you are good. And what happens in the get enumerator? Get enumerator is actually creating, which is the implementation of the I enumerator, which is doing nothing than creating instance of the token enumerator, which is another class. If you see, this is the uh, hidden um, one uh, for the sake of this slide. Uh, this implementation is um, just on your right hand side, and that's what this arrow is trying to say. So this implementation is on just on your right hand side. The token enumerator. Move this. Okay, so this token enumerator implementation, as we saw in the previous slide, it uh, inherits uh, I enumerator it's because why it inherits that uh, interface? Because the get enumerator, which is actually implementation of the I enumerator, um, expects to return I enumerator. So you must have a class uh, that uh, inherits and implements that interface. So that's the reason I have my uh, nested type which is again private because this is a, a nested type and I don't want this to be exposed to outside uh, and since um, it's a nested and it's private and it's accessible only within this class, the parent class tokens. Okay, so the uh, token enumerator uh, is implementing the I enumerator. That's the reason. And it has again another constructor and also these three members which we saw in the previous slide, uh, the move next, reset and current. This is a property. And what each of them are doing. So what uh, 
what this class is uh, focusing here is to the implementation of the navigation through the items within the collection. So to navigate through, we are actually implementing the whole code that you we usually write in a for loop, uh, but in a custom fashion here. So we actually are tracking the current position as minus one is a private member. So this variable is going to uh, refer to the current position using and it, it is initialized to minus one. That means it is uh, not initialized in other words because your array will actually is a zero based and it can never be minus one. So to ma make sure that we start with the right um, position, um, it's initialized to minus one. And uh, the tokens, uh, tokens is, if you remember, tokens is our parent class. Okay, so what's happening here is a very simple thing. Uh, tokens is passed as a parameter here. So remember this is a keyword refers to the current instance of the class. So you are passing this, that means you are passing the current instance of this tokens uh, as an input parameter to the, um, the constructor of the token enumerator. So that means it is taking a class tokens as an input parameter and it's taking, of course, it's an uh, object of type tokens. In other words, uh, it's not, um, so it's parameter type is tokens. So when it is creating instance of it, it, it is passing the current instance uh, as an input to the constructor. So using this, what happens here is, since I'm, I'm going to pass the sentence to the tokens class here, and that is broken into elements uh, inside the constructor of this token class. So the source is available inside the tokens class, right? And uh, you're writing this enumerator to navigate through the items of uh, this elements, exactly, to be precise, right? And this is passed as an uh, input to the get enumerator. So, so we have access, uh, we actually got the instance of tokens as a T here, uh, which is tokens here, which will uh, save as a private member here. And here, we're going to expose the, uh, implement the member saying for a move next and reset and current, to read through the array elements here. Okay, so it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Hope you have no confusions there. If you still have a confusion, you, all your confusions will go away once we see how it is going to run. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, I, did, I did not expand the move next reset uh, current in this slide, but uh, I will definitely show you in the code. And of course, yeah, there's another key point here the current here is of type object and uh, since object if you know there's a parent uh, type for all the types in the dot net uh, so this will uh, not make your uh, collection your uh, enumerator type safe so if you change this uh, uh, type to a, a specific data type like a string then it can become a, a strong type but in this context, uh, uh, it doesn't really make a big difference because your base um, collection itself is of uh, type string. So it's always guaranteed that we have only strings. Okay, so the main method uh, is actually creating an instance of a token, OBJ tokens, our parent class here. And what it is doing is it's it just declared uh, OBJ tokens. And here, using the new keyword, we are actually uh, initializing it with the text. Okay, and this text is a string. You see, the for each statement is a convenient way to list. Okay, so what the original demonstrate the purpose of the demonstration uh, is to use the for each right for collections. And that's why we are doing all this, and we are passing the uh, char array in which I'm passing the two delimiters. One is a space, another one is a hyphen. Uh, since this statement doesn't have any hyphens uh, uh, in the uh, in the text, so it's going to make use of only the space. So if you see, each of the words are delimited using the space, and that's when I pass the space. Okay, so that's clear. And and after that, it's a for each block, for each and a string item in OBJ tokens. If you see, OBJ tokens is our custom class. And we're using a string item in OBJ tokens and we're just reading out directly. So what internally for each looks for 
inside OBJ tokens is the get enumerator. It is going to look for the get enumerator first. And if this is not available, then 4H will not work on OBJ tokens. Okay, and similarly, it's going to look for the uh, get enumerator and then uh, call the respective methods. Okay, go and um, uh, reset and then okay, move next and read the first value and then read the current value. When the current is going to return the current element and it's that's what comes as part of your item. So for each must have all these implementations. Okay, we'll quickly see and this is the output on the right hand side. Uh, we're going to see this. Uh, uh, by running the code. That's just an FYI. I'm taking away the uh, okay console as well. Okay, and now I should crib for only one, yes, and which is your main. So this is more easy. I can select all and um, okay, so this is a little straightforward. Okay, so this is the code that we just walked through in the slide. Okay, tokens as a my parent class, which is a token, um, a string tokenizer. And we have a private member, which is going to hold the collection of strings. And my constructor is going to take um, a source as a string and also the delimiters as a character. And the elements is making use of the string. This is a source is nothing but a string, right? So string has a um, method called split. And using split, so if you see the um, the tooltip uh, that we um, that's visible here, it's uh, clearly uh, okay. Let me do that again. So if you see the tooltip, it is uh, oops, I think it's flickering too badly. Uh, I'll take it off. Um, so return the array a string array. It can break the whole string in using the given delimiters and then uh, give you the array. So this is a string array. And we are once we are done with the constructor, the key thing here is the get enumerator. So the get enumerator is actually giving the token enumerator. Uh, if I right click and take it to the definition, it is part of um, the same um, class. So we are, if I collapse this region, this, if you see this region is nothing but it's creating instance of it, passing the current instance as a parameter to the token enumerator. And the token enumerator impl implementation, uh, it has a two private members. One is the position, current position and the tokens. Um, and token is what received as an input parameter, right, TKN. So that's how the current local uh, member, TKN, uh, which is this one, right? Uh, if you see it, uh, your Intel uh, your uh, ID is uh, highlighting the keyword which where it is declared here. So TKN is a private member. This is got initialized with the value received as a parameter. Okay, and this is the straightforward implementation of the constructor. And the next immediate thing are the three uh, interface members that we are implementing. And in this case, MoveNex is just tracking the position, current position. Uh, not to exceed the max length and it's incrementing the position if it is not and uh, good yeah the position is got incremented and um, the important thing here is it is a boolean the move next is a bool uh, here uh, whenever it's uh, able to increment that means there is a next uh, element available this indicates there's a next element available so it is returning true so this boolean value is made uh, used by your uh, for each to ensure that there is a next element outside to navigate through. So whenever this uh, returns false, that means you have reached uh, to the end of the array. So that's what uh, determines uh, the for each loop to determine that you have reached the end of the array. Okay, and this is the for uh, move next and the reset, as I said, is going to just go back to the topmost one or uh, go back to the old value which is minus one and so since if you see uh, this is very custom uh, and this implementation is up to you how you best write your iteration here is all up to you you can have n number of logics within this move next uh, reset and that's how the flexibility you gain using the interfaces so 
uh, you can write any business logic within this and all you need to uh, say uh, that it is true or false okay um, and uh, the rest of the things will be invoked by the for each uh, implementation and reset you can do anything within this two blocks all it cares is again the position is also just a current uh, your local private member remember that it's a completely control is in within you you can write any code there and the current so it's a only a read only property if you see it's only it has only getter there is no setter there and what it is doing is return the tkn dot elements of position so if you see this is a typical usage of uh, reading the array element uh, uh, using the indexer so position you're all you're doing in the reset and move next is manipulating the position nothing else okay and when you say current you always ensure that you're reading the current value out of your token dot elements and the elements is uh, accessible uh, even though if you, do, if you see it carefully elements is actually a private here okay and you're accessing that elements inside this class okay according to our definition for private members what is private private can be accessible throughout a throughout the class where it is defined right so since this is a nested type which is part of the same class the private members within the same class are accessible okay and also uh, refer to my uh, uh, statement saying that uh, this uh, enumerator the I uh, where is this the token enumerator need not be a nested type it can be written outside as a standalone class you can do that so in that case you cannot uh, access the private member correct so you cannot access uh, this as a private member so in that case what you need to do is you need to pass uh, you need to either um, make a copy of the elements or expose this elements as a public member uh, in your tokens so that uh, you can still access tkn dot to say tokens uh, and still access that array uh, as a using the position so that way also it is doable so to make it easy and introduce the nested type concept and also uh, to uh, also demonstrate how can you access the private members within the nested members uh, I just added this uh, example this way Okay, so the token extractor enumerator is pretty simple. Uh, it does; it is not that complicated as it looks. Um, it all it's trying to do is iterate through the array. In, in simple, if you say, we are actually reading the this array using this whole concept only for the reason uh, that the for each um, to work on a custom classes uh, must implement the i enumerable and i enumerable must have i enumerator so those are the two interfaces must be implemented okay that's clear um, and uh, yeah this is the implementation of the token extractor and the main method comes here so here what we're trying to do here is um, creating the tokens we are using the tokens uh, this instance is created and it is initialized with the for each statement is a convenient way to list the elements there's some string and within this I'm passing two um, delimiters the second one is obviously not used because uh, there is nothing uh, um, there's no use of uh, hyphen in this string okay and they immediately we are using the for each here and iterating it reading this out okay this is something a little early so what I want to um, highlight this here so we are doing the same thing with while as well uh, we are not yet there so I'm taking that out for now okay I'm going to compile this code uh, it compiled and I'm going to run this code and um, that's the result so using for each what happened here is um, uh, we have passed the entire string and the string is broken into words in general um, people might ask you questions like this uh, how can you uh, if I want you to I will give you a string and I want you to give me the count of uh, words inside that string okay or they might ask you another way 
I'll give you a word and get me the count of number of characters or number of letters in that word. How will you write the code? So they might ask you a simple question like that. Of course, to just to get the number of uh, count of words inside a string, you don't have to do all this collection. All you need is a one single statement called the split. Because split is actually going to uh, break uh, your string into number of uh, uh, words based on the delimiter you, that you pass. So once you do that breaking, uh, which is at uh, this stage, right, uh, which is uh, inside the token, yeah, this one. So what it is getting is array. So array has a property called dot length, right? So this will give you the count of number of words, right? Once you do it. In this case, uh, you cannot, you don't have to do the whole thing. This whole thing we are doing only for the sake of using for each. Okay. This way also, this single line also will help you. Okay. That's fine because the elements uh, expects an array. So length is going to break this code. I just wanted to FYI. Um, so we'll change the uh, delimiters here. What will happen uh, if I say, if I say for hyphen each uh, and state and ment and uh, can we uh, ent ent and uh, list elements? I'm adding the uh, the second delimiter. Okay, will that work? So if you see, it is actually delimited using both the uh, delimiters. So this is uh, uh, broken, the for each, again, for has a, sp a hyphen there, and it is broken that. Uh, and wherever I have the hyphen, it's broken that into that. Okay, it's pretty neat. Okay, so the last one, uh, or not last one, so continuing, uh, the while. The while statement, you can use the while statement, and if you see the while expression, uh, the while has an expression. This is just contrary to do. If you, if you remember the do statement, do, uh, end statements and while. So while has a condition at the end. So do ensures that your uh, statements will be executed uh, at least once. This is just opposite to do. Okay. So the while is uh, just opposite. So while has a condition in the first place itself. So it checks the condition and if the condition matches then only it will fire the statements. So in this case, uh, the statements are not guaranteed to run at least once. So they can be uh, run uh, at least once or more, but cannot be guaranteed to run uh, for one uh, at least once because it depends on the condition. Okay, and uh, yes, in break statements, you can still use your uh, uh, like the break, go to, return, throw, use uh, in the while loop, just like a, a just like a do or loop or a for loop. You can still make use of them and continue statement. We have seen that. Okay, this is a code example, a simple uh, while loop, making use of uh, all those uh, break statements. Right, uh, it has a while and the condition started here. And within the condition, we are incrementing it, uh, which is a similar functionality of uh, for, wherein we declare, uh, initialize, and can check, increment all in for loop, similarly while. Um, and we are here, we are checking. Uh, this is uh, just a code to demonstrate um, these keywords, uh, the continue, go to, break, and other things, and also written. Those are the keywords which will really influence the way you navigate through the uh, your while loop, uh, break will exactly come out of the while loop, go to will go to the respective label uh, to um, uh, and will continue again. So within this go to here is a label I added for this piece of code. Okay. And when I say go to to that label, uh, when I give it go to that label, then it's uh, the, the, the control goes back to the uh, that label and then execute it and then uh, since it, the, it's not the end of the while. So while is, uh, oh sorry, while is uh, here, right? It started here and uh, ended here. So it's still within the while loop. So it will continue with the next one, um, which is the continuous statement. Even if I don't have this continuous statement, doesn't matter. It's going to iterate back uh, to the next value. And continue is a statement that will continue uh, um, with the current value. So if, you have, if the value is 4 
and it identifies continue then it's not going to uh, execute any of the other statements it's going to go back to the uh, it's kind of a reset it go it goes back and continue with the next uh, number which is uh, if it is 4 the next value will be 5 so on okay we'll quickly run this uh, and similarly the vb example here uh, this is a very straightforward thing so I don't want to spend too much time and while uh, only the uh, the the keywords like the small case and the big uh, the capitalized and the same otherwise all the same keywords are available uh, the only difference is uh, when, when you say exit then you have to say exit while we, since we are within the while and also continue while so which is in C sharp it's not that way it's just straightforward continue and go to Okay, so yeah, within a while you can have any other for loops and other things. So its context is basically um, basically defined. Uh, these are called the jump statements, in other words. Okay, and um, okay, th this is code continuation. The break statements, all these break statements are demonstrated in the same uh, code. Uh, all these uh, statements like a break, continue, go to, return, everything is uh, demonstrated in the same code. Um, and there's another example there. So we'll uh, go ahead and quickly run this code. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward one. Okay, uh, let me take this code away. Okay, I will take this off and take this back so that. Okay, so so this is the same code demonstrating both the while loop um, and also the uh, other break statements, which is continue, go to, break, uh, and also written, uh, if I believe it's covered in this. So this is only for the while loop, so we'll uh, have this. So this is a sim pretty simple one. Um, so continue block reached uh, and uh, when I hit the continue, so when its value is one, so we uh, indicating that we have reached the continue at that time it gone back and the next value got incremented to 2 uh, so none of the other things got uh, uh, probably we can actually uh, debug this that will give you more insight okay so the while loop the first case uh, I got incremented it's 0 to 1 and then now uh, um, the first statement is written and it reached uh, 1. So what happened is soon after continue, if you observe, it's gone back to while loop. And the condition got checked, incremented, and written. And this time it's number 2. And it says go to, go to here, which is the label below. So it jumped to that uh, label, it written down, and it says continue. And soon after it sees continue, it jumped back to while. Okay, and... Uh, and the next one comes for, uh, it's three actually, right? It's going to be three. So it, uh, this should not be matched. So in that case, it uh, is coming to else. So else is uh, just an else block. We just reach the else block when the condition is um, three. So the interesting point to note here, so the go to label, right? We, no, we didn't ask to jump, right? So we uh, go to uh, the label uh, will still be fired uh, irrespective of whoever calls it or not, uh, except that this uh, statement uh, uh, can be used as a jump statement from the here this block to the this block, uh, but it will be still be uh, executed as part of the as, a, uh, as part of the series uh, line of statements. Okay, that's the key thing to remember. And again, uh, to be frank, just to cover that there is something called label, I'm showing this. Otherwise, uh, in real examples, we should never, never try to use this. Okay, don't ever try to use the label concept. Label is a completely old concept and sh should not be used uh, in the programming. It's like a, available for backward compatibility. And if you still think you really need this, then double think. Um, think twice 
thrice, four times, five times, ten times, and finally, if you think, yeah, yeah, there is no other way I can do this, then okay, then you can go ahead and use it. But this is not a good way to use uh, go to statements. Uh, there are several disadvantages, like the one we see here. Although there is a go to there, but that block will still be uh, executed, uh, and it will not be in your control to control. Okay. Uh, and uh, the last one is the number four, and four is end if, where in which we are actually asking to break. Once it sees the break, it's going to actually come out of the while loop, uh, irrespective of what. Okay. Uh, although the condition is not satisfied here because the n is still less than ten, right? So it will uh, soon after it sees break, it's going to jump out of that while loop. So that's the overview of the while loop as well as the, um, uh, the break statements. Okay, I just try, wanted to cover both in one shot to make it simple. Okay, yep. So we are done with that sample, and um, and I think there is one more call for jump statements, right? Yep. Uh, the little addition to this is that the it has the return statements too. Okay, so in this example, I don't have the uh, written. In this example, I might have the written as well. So it's the same code, uh, only difference uh, is the written keyword. So we have seen the written keyword. In functions, you use this written keyword to return the uh, value. Uh, and that is a, um, a word statement, jump statements. That's part of the jump statements. And uh, to demonstrate the same thing, I just have to take this out and uh, we can see the return behavior. In this case, well, I'm just calling the do jump and uh, expecting that uh, call to return a, a value of type int. And uh, this method is actually doing the whole same story and it is uh, returning n, right? Uh, at the end of the loop, uh, I've just commented the break so that it won't break uh, in the middle. Uh, and it iterate through the end of it and let's see how it's going to do. Okay, so it's uh, went to the end of it, uh, 10 and uh, yeah, so the last one is R. So did we come here? Actually, I should have put uh, the read at the end of it and then I will see the last line also. Okay, so the last value is 10. So if I want to um, uh, break in the middle, um, okay, so if you carefully notice, this written keyword, written is outside the while loop, right? So if I put this break, then I will, I sh I will uh, get the value, um, uh, what, 4? When 4 is reached that time, this while is going to be uh, ended and the value is going to be written out. So let's see that. So there you go, I have four. So that's the um, behavior of a break statement, okay, which is broken uh, at n is equal to four. So although these are uh, simple keywords, uh, but they are very, very useful keywords, so you will definitely make use of them um, um, in a day-to-day -day programming life whenever you play with uh, collections and arrays. Okay, so we are good there. I want to quickly run, run, run. <laughs> I don't want to. Okay, let me know if I'm going too fast. Then um, I can take a hold. Um, and uh, exceptions. So just give me a second. Okay, exceptions. Um, so if you see what uh, most of you are, should be aware of what is an exception. And we have seen uh, in some of our code examples where a system breaks for known or unknown issues. Um, those kind of uh, anomalies are called, uh, situations are called exceptions, which um, uh, can happen, uh, could be a, a, a result of a wrong code or a wrong value at the runtime that can raise an exception. And the exceptions are, or for a wider topic, um, and if you see on the right hand side the 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 inheritance of a hierarchy of the exception, I'll take a close watch of that uh, hierarchy. 
So if you see the root as we know, system.object is the root and the next immediate one is the system.exception and we are talking about the system.exception um, in today's session and uh, and it has another root to it uh, which is a system exceptions and there's a bunch of exceptions so that can happen at a different uh, places and there are a bunch of exceptions which can happen based on the type of code that you are writing okay and uh, uh, since we yeah we will see uh, one of the example <coughs> this operation if you see int num is equal to 10 by 0 so if you see the highlighted uh, underscore uh, uh, by the compiler itself saying that uh, this is a type of exception right so it's actually compile time error although uh, because I'm giving some kind of a constant value so there's a 10 and 0 consider you have two variables as uh, uh, number 1 and number 2 and those are number to um, evaluate it for the, based on some uh, business uh, logic to zero, and at that point of time, that statement will be uh, will become a system dot arithmetic exception. Okay, so system dot arithmetic exception is a class of exception, so that will be and current um, that will be raised uh, when you are playing with the numbers and uh, arithmetic operations have um, some has an invalid. Um, operation done and in this case uh, the specific exception is a divide by zero okay so divide by zero is a, a, a specific type of exception that can cause when you're trying to divide a number with a zero and it's of type arithmetic exception so there are a bunch of other exceptions that are under the arithmetic exceptions okay and again this is rooted back from yeah so this is rooted back from system not exception. So this is the hierarchy uh, in which the exception happens. So this is a, um, if you see the inheritance hierarchy, right? So that's the keyword uh, goes back to the entire object-oriented programming uh, principles. So you can have uh, the specific type of exception uh, at this instance, and it can be a, have a generic type of exception again. So what makes a difference being specific and generic? Uh, depends upon uh, what level of um, um, knowledge you will have uh, or assumption you will make uh, when you're writing a code. Uh, so when you feel if you're playing with file I/O operation, it, you can predict that okay, I'm trying to write a file to a given location, and what are possible exceptions or specific ex exceptions that I can expect. Uh, for example, if the uh, the file share whatever is available, if the file share is not accessible or the folder that I'm trying to write to cannot exist, so things like that, or if uh, even the folder is existing, if I don't have uh, permissions to write a file to that, so those are all type of uh, information or type of analysis that you will make to uh, assess uh, my code can uh, result in these set of uh, exceptions. So. Base, if this exception occurs, then what is that I should do? So things like that. So you can handle all those specific type of exceptions using the uh, try catch blocks, which we're going to see now. And the bottom the, the bottom most part here is the interesting one. So if you use this uh, link, then it has a bunch of all the. Oops, sorry. Okay, so hope the link works. Yeah, so the link is uh, working. Um, so if I just open that link, so it goes back, takes you back to this uh, uh, MSDN. So MSDN um, has, as I mentioned, it's a, a good point of reference. And even this, um, uh, the hierarchical tree, I pulled it from here. And this has all the list of exceptions available in the system. So I could able to show only the part of it, uh, but it's a uh, bunch of a list uh, um, that all the exceptions listed in the in this example if I take you to the arithmetic exception then we can see all type of ex arithmetic exceptions possibly can occur like the overflow exception uh, not finite number exception and divided by zero there are three basic um, classification of these exceptions and we have handled the divided by zero 
Okay, so um, just to recap on that, um, so this uh, inf information you can make use to determine what type of exception I can ex uh, expect. Uh, for example, you're playing with collections, so what are all the exceptions available in the collection? Uh, in the collections, we have a system.collection, so generic. Uh, has a exception there's only one uh, which is key not found exception so in the collection if you're trying to read through a key uh, this is again specific to generics not the arrays and other things okay so generic is a different topic we will be covering that definitely uh, but not now uh, down the line and similarly data uh, if you are handling with the data operations then you have a system dot data dot db con concurrency exceptions where uh, if you know the database concepts then uh, these are a wide variety of uh, exceptions that can happen okay and yeah so if you see this is a sealed keyword this is a modifier in other words uh, which will make this class db concurrency exception uh, as a sealed one that means uh, no one can inherit this class Okay, so it's, it is itself is inheriting from system dot exception. Okay, things like that. So whenever you come across a seal keyword, don't put a question mark on your face. Uh, it means is it, this class cannot be inherited. Okay, keep it in mind. Okay, so so those are the key key references. So you can just key Google in our MSDN. It will give you the list of things. So whenever you do a code, uh, it's always wise to. Uh, uh, judge what all types of exception can occur and if you're not really sure uh, what uh, type of exception I might get then you can still uh, handle as a generic exception so since the hierarchical tree roots back to system dot exception uh, you can handle as a system dot exception so in material or if your code is going to give any of the these exceptions in the root uh, they all can be caught just using the system dot exception because it's the root of all these exceptions. Hope it's clear. And yes, a couple of important uh, members available in the um, exception. Okay, remember we uh, this is again all part of the statements. Uh, the exception handling has a couple of statements uh, like a try, catch, uh, finally. You know, those are the statements that we're going to cover actually. To cover that, I'm trying to cover the exception as a concept also. Um, so we, uh, so the exception uh, overview of system dot exception class represents the error that occurs during the application execution, and some of the important properties. These are the properties uh, which will help you in um, um, knowing the information about the exception. So one is the inner exception, which will give you an uh, another object of type system dot exception. Again, uh, exceptions are rooted uh, within itself. It can have exceptions uh, uh, of a different type again. So they, are, they have a nested root wherein uh, the inner exception uh, can return a system dot exception. And again, uh, that inner exception can have another inner exception. So so on, that root can be um, uh, and, uh, and endless. It's going to be a recursive um, uh, referring one on the other. It depends, all depends upon the type of exception that occurs. Some might end up at one stage and some don't. See, it all depends how you how this exception got bubbled up to the root. Okay, so we will see more of that uh, down the line. And the message gives you the text that will describe uh, uh, the actual message of the exception, what happened. And the stack trace is a very, very useful uh, inf information. If this will root back you to the uh, the code line of code where exactly the ex exception occurred. Uh, that that will give you the information as the sequence in which the uh, the calls are made. Um, and if you remember when we covering the debugging uh, options available in Visual Studio, we did talk about the call stack, and the the call stack information is <coughs> given uh, as a call, uh, stack trace. So this will root back to the uh, number of um, uh, statements that have been executed to reach the point where the exception occurred. So that will give you good information of uh, the line of code uh, with the line number uh, uh, and of course possibly the column number also uh, to tell you where exactly they occurred rooted from. Okay, that's a very useful uh, method. So if you see this is an intelligence view of the arithmetic exception I believe. Oh no, this is a different exception, which is a uh, format exception uh, coming from a system exception again. So this is just a format exception, which is uh, 
uh, trying to convert probably it's a conversion related error wherein we're trying to convert a string to a number. Uh, if you see, this is the operation that we're trying to do. Uh, so that's the level of information if you see. <clears throat> so inner exception is null. So that means there is no uh, next uh, immediate uh, exception that is available. Okay, so that means you don't have to drill down into this. That's done. The message saying input string no, uh, was not in a correct format. So if you see this text, that may not be always uh, useful information, right? Uh, input string was not in a correct format. Who knows what? What happened? What do, what do you mean by correct format? What format you want? Things like that. So that time you have a uh, stack trace that can help you more. So in this case, if you see um, the stack trace is talking about a system dot number dot string to number. So it's the kind of a method that is trying to use a string is convert trying to convert to a number. That means so you're, you're, this gives a hint. Uh, I don't have the entire stack trace here. Uh, this will definitely route you back to the line of code where this error occurred. So which will give you pretty much which operation actually tried to give you this error. Even without that level of information, at this stage I can still say, uh, since it is uh, a numeric operation, a number operation, and you are trying to convert a string to a number. So it's clearly de descriptive. So probably it failed because uh, you are passing some uh, a number as a string and number uh, the string is trying to convert to a number and that failed. Probably what would be happen because I might have passed some special characters in the string or have some spaces in the string or I might have uh, some alphabets in the string uh, that could result to this error. So you can easily um, uh, go to the line of code to fix it. And the three most important uh, methods available in system dot exception. So that is get base exception, which will give you the root exception which has caused. Remember, I've been saying uh, the inner exception uh, can have another object of type system dot exception. So again, since it is system dot exception, it also has another type called inner exception. So on, uh, it can go to the nth root. So if just to know, instead of iterating through the whole list, if you just want to know which is the root cause, to just to know which is the root cause, you just call get base exception. So get base exception will give you the root cause which resulted into the exception that you see now. Okay, this is again a very useful one, uh, get base exception. You will be needing this, uh, especially when you're trying to handle exception at the application level, uh, especially uh, in web-based applications or a Windows-based application, because you, do, you really don't know what exception occurred at which page and which uh, method, which field recreated an error, or it happens you're trying to handle it at the application level. So at the application level, if you, you simply get an exception of type, uh, some type, but all of that, uh, that type will definitely have the family of uh, uh, rooted from standard exception. And simply by calling get base exception, it will tell you what specific exception happened and it will pinpoint exactly where it went wrong. And all you need is that exception to be logged. Okay, and get type. So get type is again the same thing. So it will give you the type of the current instance. Uh, it can be of any specific type. Uh, in this case, a format exception is a type uh, will be returned. And to string will convert the entire uh, information of the system node exception into a uh, string. That, we, that includes the error message and as well as the uh, stack trace and other things. So to string is again, uh, it can be overridden. Um, if you have a custom exceptions again and implement your own uh, implementation to two strings. Okay, so and this is the try, catch, throw, try, finally, try, catch. These are the different uh, uh, exception handling statements available to handle the exception. And uh, remember, needless to say, this is a very hot topic. Uh, people will definitely ask questions on um, this through uh, multiple ways people can ask uh, or can I have uh, try without uh, catch finally or can I have try with finally without finally so on. Um, so try catch finally how it goes. So uh, the try is the block in which you're going to write the statements that going to actually do the operation that you intended to do. 
Okay, so in this case, uh, in this example, within the tri block, if you have, a, if you see the open the bracelets and close the bracelets, and within this, I'm trying to actually uh, take an input. Uh, this is the uh, get input method, which is simply uh, prompting the user with the string that is passed in, and uh, taking the user command line uh, input, which is a console read line. Uh, we're getting the input as a string, and we're returning that string as an output. So okay, so here I'm calling this. Um, uh, get input uh, passing the enter a number one and the enter a number one will what use a C and they will enter the value and that value is written as a string so here I'll get as a string and I'm parsing that using int dot parse so that I will uh, get whatever user keyed in uh, translated to number which is integer okay so in, I initialized both of these D N and D uh, with zero so I have a number n and a number d, uh, number one, number two, and I'm trying to divide both. Okay, uh, m, uh, which is the result. Uh, here I'm uh, declare the m and doing a math operation, arithmetic operation, division. So this is the same scenario which I wanted to try to demonstrate, uh, all based on uh, what are the values that I pass in, what will happen, uh, what type of exception this can occur so the immediate thing I can nothing of is the because it is an automatic exception I can expect to receive a specific exception which is a divided by zero exception okay I can put a straight line can't I yeah yep yeah there you go the straight line so and um, this is a specific exception handling so when I know um, the exact exception that can happen then I can catch it using the catch block I say catch and uh, I'm expecting uh, divided by zero ex and within this block I can write the code uh, to handle that um, block right so a little bit straight straight yes okay so within this divided by zero is there, uh, for the sake of a demonstration uh, all I'm doing is logging that exception on the screen using the uh, right line our most uh, favorite one and a string dot format one specifically saying okay system divided by zero exception occurred and caught uh, and of course uh, this is uh, something new probably uh, environment dot uh, new so this is uh, to have a have a new line uh, so this is environment of new line is again a very uh, robust implementation wherein uh, this goes back to any platform uh, uh, specific new line uh, so this will give you any platforms independent new land character so that uh, it can work in any platform okay and uh, uh, if you want to add a new line then definitely you can make use of this and of course uh, hyphen T is a tab um, uh, if you want to add a tab uh, in this case I wanted to add a tab to this text that has been shown and uh, this is uh, of course a placeholder and within this placeholder the ex dot message is uh, feeded so that's the uh, uh, typical logging uh, implementation I have and the same logging implementation I'm going to have for the uh, for the remaining as well so okay so that's the specific uh, exception handling and when I come back to the generic exception handling so this is what I'm sure this can happen okay so there can be something else also can happen uh, like the format exception wherein I enter a alphabets um, and uh, the alphabets will try to pass and it will break so this might give you some kind of exception um, which I am not aware of or which I don't know what can happen so in that case I can still do a generic exception handling wherein I just say catch system dot exception if you know system dot exception is a mother of all exceptions so this is still good so other than the divide by zero exception anything else happens it will come into this this block and here also I'm doing uh, for the demo sake I'm doing the same thing I'm saying the below generic exception occurred and caught and uh, the generic exception I have two uh, uh, placeholders here one is zero and one and uh, okay I got the wrong snapshot there is an error here okay ignore that um, so the get type, a uh, type of the exception because I'm not sure what type of exception is that. So I'm going to get the type and also get the message. And of course here I'm trying to throw the exception. Uh, what will happen if I throw? 
what if this uh, uh, block of code, whatever I have right now, is uh, called by this. In this case, uh, it is a main method, so it doesn't matter because this is the entry point uh, wherein we're getting it. If the same implementation is part of another method of a class uh, and uh, you definitely want the caller to notify that something happened, right? Instead of just logging this and keeping quiet, if you just log this and keep quiet, uh, the caller will never know that there is an exception occurred. Um, because the caller need to know in this case, for example, int dot parse, right? So int dot parse um, uh, is going to throw an exception if uh, the parse fails, right? So imagine if the int dot parse don't throw an exception, uh, it will just eat away the exception and uh, do nothing, give me some zero if some error happens, then I, it's hardly predictable for me to uh, write a code like this. So I want to handle the whatever uh, invalid statements that or invalid operation that can happen at runtime, and handle them um, so that uh, I communicate the respective exceptions in the uh, in the proper way. Either give a user friendly message or do an alternative route to handle that or report some uh, report the log uh, to as a log something like that. So you can do a number of things with the uh, exception. So it is necessary uh, when you implement uh, a class and methods to throw those exceptions whenever it, they happen. So for that, you use throw. Okay, and the last one, um, but not least one. Um, um, okay, okay. Yeah, the finally block. The final block is a very interesting block, and uh, this will be uh, this block will be. Uh, visited um, irrespective of uh, an exception occurred in try and caught or no. So irrespective of uh, if there is an exception occurred or not, finally block will be executed. So in this case, I did make a good use of this finally block in this case. What I wanted to do is uh, get input from the user, would you like to try again? So the same code uh, imagine some exception happened instead of uh, ending the program and rerunning to do the same thing what I'm going to do is I'm asking I will ask the user to uh, choose an option if he want to really continue redo the same thing again that means go back and redo the whole thing or terminate the program so this is try again I'm taking the uh, user option so would you like to try again yes or no and they will whatever input is passed, I'm trying to uppercase so that if user enters a small case or uppercase, the respect of what, uh, I will still validate that to Y, okay? So that uh, uh, it makes it as a case sensitive input. And try again is a Boolean, of course, you are trying to compare uh, the input to Y, so this will evaluate to a Boolean and try again is a Boolean. If you see, try again is a local variable, which is a Boolean. Okay, so the next immediate thing, I didn't put it here, uh, which will check. Um, so this is the same implementation in uh, vb.net again. So try, catch, uh, cache. You can have multiple catch statements and you can have only one try. Okay, and you can have multiple catch and only one finally block. Okay, within each of those catches, you can uh, have a, a respect to throw. You cannot have multiple throws within the same catch. So People will ask you things like that, questions, okay, silly questions like saying, okay, can I have uh, multiple catch statements uh, within a try block? Yes, you can have. Can I have uh, multiple throw statements within a catch? No, you can have only one throw because throw is a similar to break, okay? Once, you, once it reaches throw, it's kind of a similar uh, to a return statement or a break statement. That means it is going to come out of it. Uh, it's going to terminate the whole thing and uh, come out of that method. So in that case, uh, if you have multiple throws, then it can only one throw can be reached. So in that case, you can have multiple throws, right? And people will, might ask you, can I have multiple finally blocks in a try? No, you can have only one finally block in a, uh, because a finally block is going to be visited only once and there's no point in having any uh, final, multiple finally blocks, right? So it's going to be only one. You can have multiple catch blocks because 
each of the catch can have a specific or generic exception handling. So if you see the tree, there's a big tree, right? So you can expect any number of uh, exceptions within your try block. So you can have any number of catch blocks. There is no limit. But um, you need to sequence them in a correct order. So that's again an important thing. So the catch block is uh, pretty much like a switch case, wherein the first check will happen, the second check will happen, third check will happen, uh, and only one of the catch block will be uh, visited. So you need to be carefully chosen. If, for example, if you write the uh, system dot uh, exception at the first place and write the generic exception followed by, then what will happen? Only your generic exception will be visited. Rest of the specific exception will not be visited, although they occur. Because the order in which it's going to look for is, you can refer to as just like a switch case, wherein it starts with the first case, next case, third case, fourth case, so on. So if whatever matches for that respective case is going to visit that block and come out of it and go to the finally block, if at all it's there. Got it? So you always have to make sure the system dot exception block is at the end of all your multiple catches. If at all you have multiple catch blocks. Okay, that's a very important thing. Um, okay, let's demo. Oh, save this and I'll go back to the exception statements. We have a good number of um, code blocks here. Okay, and we'll try to cover at least something. Yeah, the try catch uh, custom we don't want to do right now, so it is a try catch one. Okay, I'm going to uncomment this part. Time flies like a rocket. Hardly we can able to cover a couple of them, right? So topics are becoming more lengthy day by day. And of course, um, they are lengthy. Okay, so this example is what exactly what we just saw. Uh, it's demonstrating uh, a typical try cache block. And uh, we'll see all those uh, basic things that we have just uh, talked about. And uh, we will uh, add a breakpoint. Okay, before we go to breakpoint, let's run this straight away. Okay, as, I, as the first statement says, um, so again, uh, don't be uh, surprised with this statement, get input. I just uh, modularize the um, uh, statement so that I can make use of this every time. Get input, this is just prompting the user with whatever text I passed in and take the input. So this is what get input is does. So enter uh, number one. So I'm going to set 10, okay? And uh, number two, uh, similarly, enter a number two. We are here and I'll say two and I say enter. Okay, so good. So the result is five. So what it did is a math operation or arithmetic operation dividing 10 by two and you got the result five. And that's what happened here, which is successful, right? In this case, it is successful. So none of the catch block got fired, right? So that's the key thing to know. So catch blocks will be executed or visited only when an exception occurs in the try block, point number one. That's important. Uh, don't ever try to memorize this. It will not help you, okay? Um, so the try block, if any exception occurs, then of course the catch block, the respective catch blocks will be fired. And in which order, that we'll see. Okay, we'll see that. So till now, so the catch block did not fire and it went back to would you like to try again, which is a part of my finally block. Right? So this is what you like to try again is my finally block. And what happens in the finally block is what we'll see now. I'll say uh, small y. And what happened? It went back to enter number one. It's repeating the program, in other words. So that happens uh, outside the try catch. So what happens is I just talk, uh, got the Boolean value evaluating to is equal to, and then if this is true, uh, in simple, by default, you check for true, right? So I, I can do this or, or also I can say is equal to true. That's also fine. Uh, then I'm simply using the go to operation here. Go to start over. The jump statement which I said not to use, I'm using it here, okay, just for the demo purpose. 
because definitely you will never never write a program like this in a real world it's going to be completely different right so this is just for a demo purpose it's fine and start over is actually starting from here right again it's coming it, it did not start from here if it start from here then what will happen it will fail because you already have n and d created and you cannot redeclare them right so it should start uh, just below the declaration and uh, the rest of the things is uh, what available. So now I'll do some wrong operation. 10, comma, and 0 divided by. Okay, automatic error. And now I see an exception. What happened? Uh, system dot divide by 0 exception occurred and caught. Attempted to divide by 0. It's very clear enough, right? It's very, very clear enough. Anyone can understand what is this exception about. And what I did here is... Um, this specific exception handling. It actually reached the specific exception handling block wherein it says divide by zero occurred and caught and attempt to divide by zero. Okay, which is part of your ex dot message. Okay, and now um, so we saw a try block got executed, an exception occurred, and the exception respect to exception block got fired. That means we have two X catch blocks, but only one of them got visited, not the second one. Okay, we will take uh, the uh, um, the program to visit the second part also. How will I do that? By doing other than the divide by zero operation. Like uh, say, I'll try to say ten. I think that uh, computer is going to be smart enough to understand what is ten, but it is not. It is broken. Since I have throw, it's actually trying to throw the exception. Uh, since it is the uh, entry point for the program, uh, during debug operation, it's going to stay here forever. It's not going to go forward. And the key point to note here is that the, the generic exception block got visited now because uh, we did not handle uh, the format exception as a specific here. If I handle the format exception as a specific, then that block will be visited and not the system dot exception. What I'll do for now is end this program and uh, go and uh, comment this through. Okay, and also what I'll do is I will change the order of the cache block. I will take the generic block and see what happens. Okay. and look at this compiler, what it says. A previous catch clause already catches all exceptions of this or a super type system dot exception. So it's a compile time error, not even a runtime error. Okay, so the system will not allow you People might ask you a tough question like this. If I do this, is that a runtime error or a compile time error? Uh, but that's going to be a kind of a ridiculous question. Uh, but still, people do ask a ridiculous questions outside. And uh, okay, so if at all you come back across people asking such kind of questions, right? Uh, it's hard to remember, okay? And it doesn't matter also if if it is a compile time error or a runtime error. Uh, if they ask such questions, then they just wanted to demonstrate what they know and uh, just to tease people, uh, they might ask us questions like that and they try to be over smart. But uh, in real world, if you try to do this way, compiler will always stop you doing the wrong things, right? It doesn't matter, right? As long as you know what is a try, catch, finally, and how to use that, you're good. Okay, don't worry about such kind of questions coming around. But you need to remember one thing that the order in which uh, they are uh, positioned make a difference. So uh, this will make a big difference uh, because, for example, if I do this way, right, uh, let's see if a compiler is smart enough. Because if we, we know that uh, divide by zero is from the uh, automatic exceptions, right? So I will uh, make it generic now. So I'll go one step up and say system dot uh, automatic, uh, where is this, automatic exception, right? And now let me compile this. So again, it's smart enough. So it, it knows the hierarchy in which the exceptions are occurring, right? So it is saying the same thing. So this previous, uh, uh, previous catch clause already catches all exceptions uh, for this. So because if you see, 
arithmetic exception is at the higher root than the divided by 0. We saw that uh, divided by 0 is uh, a, a subset of arithmetic exception. So it is a higher than the divided by 0. So you cannot put a higher um, uh, exception uh, top of the lower ones. So the order in which you keep is important. So and also at this point also remember that it is a um, compiled error, right? And if I put this way, that is fine, which is good. Can I have a try, uh, a try catch finally without a catch block? Let us see. What can I have without any catch blocks? How uh, meaningful will that will be? Okay, so let me try. I can still do that. Okay, so catch is optional. So what will happen in this case? Let me do that. And I put the wrong code, entered it, it got caught still, right? So what happened is it's not handled. So it says clearly that it is unhandled exception. So whenever you don't handle that exception, that means it becomes as a unhandled exception. So if you don't handle it, then application is going to break for a toss, like it's going to break for nothing and users will see all kind of messages like input string no, was not in a correct format. Uh, someone will see on the screen, input screen, what the input screen you're talking about? Who knows? No one knows. So it's always important to handle them and uh, make it more user friendly than the uh, system friendly. So technically you can still have try and without catch. Okay. So people do ask things like that. Can I have try without catch? Yes, you can have. So that means you're not handling any of the exceptions that you occurs in the try block. Okay. In various situations you might use that. Okay. Just try it uh, and finally. So you might want to do you make use of finally block in that case. Uh, can I have again another immediate question. Can I have a try without catch and finally also? Okay. Let's see. Doesn't make any sense having try and catch and uh, try without catch and finally? Does it make any real sense? It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. So it says the error is clearly says expected catch or finally. So what it indicates that you must have either catch or finally whenever you use try. Okay. So it really doesn't make any sense uh, without either of them. Okay, that's a logical thing. Um, so in this case, uh, I can have catch, multiple catch statements, and of course, without a finally statement. Okay, so this is allowed. Do it. Oh, try again because try again is gone for a toss. Uh, we are trying to use it without uh, initializing it. What if I initialize you here? Will you be happy? Let's ask the compiler. Will you be happy? Yes, you're happy. So I don't have a finally block uh, here and I can have try catch. So remember those uh, key things. Uh, it's a, just a common sense thing. Uh, what is the use of having a try without catch and finally? It doesn't make any sense. So, okay, no, it cannot be possible. Straightforward. And can I have a multiple cache statements? Yes, you can have multiple cache statements, uh, which makes perfect sense. Um, keeping the hierarchy of these exceptions in mind. And the, the lowest hierarchical, uh, the order in which you catch the exception also matters. The order in which the uh, uh, they, they exist in the hierarchy. So the lowest one will come the, um, uh, the top and the uh, highest order uh, will go to the bottom most. Okay? Uh, that's a compile time error if you try to handle generic exception first and the specific exception later. Okay, that's again an important thing to see. So that's the overview of the exception uh, handling statements and uh, um, we will continue with the remaining part of the exceptions. So we are in session 14 and we did see the uh, how can we use the initializing the arrays and declaration for both the, uh, for all the multi or uh, single dimension and multi-dimension and as well as jagged 
arrays with a very good demo. We did see the specific redeem preserve in VB dot and how can we uh, uh, resize the arrays uh, in VB dot net and it's not possible with C sharp dot net and with a very good demo. And we did see how can we uh, read an arrays using for each for all the types of uh, uh, arrays that we have. And uh, yeah, for jagged array, that's a, uh, an open question we have. Uh, you can try it out yourself. And for collections, we did start uh, getting into the collections overview uh, and using for each with collection classes. And we did see what is an I enumerable interface and how can we make use of that uh, for string tokenizer implementation in this, uh, uh, in this example. And also, yeah, so this is about the uh, complete deep dive into the collections uh, classes and I enumerable interface uh, implementation for string tokenizer as an example with a very good demo. And we did see what is a while in C sharp dot net and also uh, VB dot net um, iteration statements. Uh, and uh, we did see the jump statements uh, also. Oh, what is uh, the break, continue, go to, return, throw, all these are different types of jump statements available in both the languages and we did see a very good demo with a code example uh, in both the languages and we did see uh, what is an exception, system.exception overview uh, and also uh, how can we handle the exceptions uh, uh, and the hierarchy of the system.exception uh, uh, object uh, inside the exception handle in Dotnet framework in general. And we did see uh, uh, the inner exception and the messages and stack trace are a couple of uh, important uh, uh, methods uh, properties available within the exception namespace. Uh, the properties we did explore what all these uh, and how can they we make use of them. And also we did see some of the most important methods uh, for system -wide exception class which is the base class for all the exceptions uh, that you can handle. The get base exception, get type and to string are a couple of uh, key uh, methods available. And exception handling statements such as try catch, finally blocks, we did see a very good demo and uh, also uh, in vp.net we did see a similar example and nested try catch we did see. We'll continue with the next session uh, uh, covering the custom exception handling scenarios uh, and for now we'll take a uh, break at this point and continue with the next topics in the next session.